Welcome to Sky Team's People First with Morag Barrett. Welcome to this week's episode of People First. And my guest this week is Jeffrey Shaw, who is often described as an authority and an advocate for self-employed business owners. He's valued for his actionable, in the trenches approach to achieving business and life success. And why shouldn't he be? How many people can say they've never worked for anyone else? Jeffrey's career started selling eggs door to door at 14 years old and led to a lifetime of self-employment. In his 20s, he built and ran a portrait photography business, becoming one of the most sought after portrait photographers for affluent families in the US. His portraits have been on The Oprah Winfrey Show and CBS News, In People and O Magazine, and in the halls of Harvard University and the Norman Vincent Peel Center, and countless beautiful homes across the US. Today, Jeffrey is the author of Lingo and the Self-Employed Life, founder of the Self-Employed Business Institute, a keynote speaker, and a host of the Self-Employed Life podcast, with nearly 2 million downloads. His TEDx talk is featured on TED.com. He's a LinkedIn learning instructor, contributor to Entrepreneur Magazine, and speaks about business ownership and luxury marketing at association events, entrepreneurial groups, and conferences. Jeffrey, welcome to People First. Well, thank you. I don't know why it is I get exhausted just listening to that bio. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's exhausting and it's intriguing because well, it's also been over so a long. It's been it. over a long span, so this did not happen all <laughs> five years. I've been at this for forty years, so in all fairness. <laughs> okay, so you've learned a thing or two, possibly mm. from the school of hard knocks and the pragmatic you know, just well-worn road. But I want to go back to your origin story. So mm -hmm. even before you were a professional egg seller, yeah. and we can come back to that as your mm -hmm. first career, when you were in elementary school, and if the teacher said to you, Jeffrey, listen up, what do you want to be when you grow up? What was your childhood dream? Um, oddly enough, I wanted to be an ocean oceanographer. Like I just, I wanted to be underwater and I wanted to be in sub, a submarine's fascinated me and I've yet to be in a moving submarine. I've been in a stationary submarine, but um, yeah, I just, there was something about submerging in the oceans that, that absolutely intrigued me. So you obviously don't suffer from claustrophobia here. Um, I don't, not a bit. And it actually never occurred to me, but uh, I don't know how comfortable I'd be in the depths of the ocean, like in the reality of it all. But as a kid, it certainly seemed I just think ocean life is fascinating. And, and it's definitely, I've said to my children, my kids, uh, children, they're all adults, but I've said to my kids that they'll know I've lived my life well if they'll have no idea where to bury me because I tend to move a fair often. But the one common denominator is the ocean. Um, mm -hmm. So chances are they can just sprinkle my ashes in the ocean somewhere because I'm always nearby the ocean no matter where I've ever lived. All right. And then there'll be a little bit of you everywhere, no matter where they look. Yes, it I is environmentally like illegal, but, you know, they'll, they'll find a way of making it happen. <laughs> okay, yeah, there is that. To it. And let's hope that that is some way off. Anywho. Indeed. Uh, so I was reading your latest book, The Self-Employed Life, and also thinking, where were you 17 years ago when I started Sky Team? But, hey, our paths have crossed now. And I was intrigued and amused by the opening egg story. So since I did reference that in your introduction... Help the listeners and the viewers of People First. Tell them about your egg um, extravaganza. Exactly. <laughs> you know, and the crazy thing is that I'm actually I'm giving, um, a, I'm delivering a, a brand new talk uh, in the luxury market to a fabulous group of designers uh, next week. And I'm, I'm starting with this chicken poop story, which you would think, why in the world would you introduce this as luxury marketing? But I have to say, I think most of my business lessons today came from selling eggs door to door. Like I learned everything. And that I, I'm pretty convinced that's why I've never worked for anybody else. Because at 14 years old, I started selling eggs door to door. I lived in the country. It was so remote. Uh, there were a lot of farms around. And I had this bright idea. And I think it was a good idea. Like, why not home delivery of eggs? So I struck a deal with a local farmer to go Thursday afternoons after school. And um, he managed to buy the, the cardboard cartons eggs come in. So he bought the cartons for me. And then I would go and I, I 
purchased a dozen eggs and I think I spent, I think I paid 25 cents for a dozen eggs wholesale <laughs> and I filled up the cartons on Thursday afternoons. And then on Saturdays, I would sell the eggs door to door. My mother also owned a beauty parlor in town. So I would pack up cartons of dozens of eggs for her salon uh, because I wanted to sell them on Saturdays. So I learned, again, this learned so much at 14 years old. It's like, when do people most want eggs? It's Sunday morning. So you sell them on Saturdays. Um, it, you know, I went door to door and made it convenient. I, looking back, I laugh. I was like, I was selling farm fresh eggs before they were a thing. You know, now it's mm -hmm. like such a, a big marketing ploy. It's like I was selling authentically, you know, uh, farm fresh eggs. So the the turning point, again, everything I, I'll tell you one, here's one of the big life lessons I learned from that. And then I'll get down to kind of the, the fun part of the story, which is a strong business lesson. But the life lesson I learned which is why I became self-employed for the rest of my life was I was a, a terribly shy kid, petrified of the world. So to go door to door selling eggs was about the most daring, scariest, lunatic, lunatic thing I could think to do when you're that shy. And in fact, you know, I, I had to drive from house to house with all these eggs. So I used to borrow my mother's car or whatever, my, whichever my parents' car was available. I was be well below driving age, which was 16 at the time. And I'm 14, mm. but I lived in the country. Nobody's going to care. Nobody's going to stop you. I could barely reach the gas pedal, but well enough. And I was petrified, but I was having, I was learning so much. I was, it just jazzed me so much to conduct business like to actually go to somebody's house and sell eggs and they give you money. And I just, I was absolutely fascinated by the process of doing business. The big life lesson I learned is that no matter how big an obstacle is, no matter how scary something is, as long as there's some, a benefit that's bigger than the fear, you'll stick with it. You know, and, and that to me is if I believe I wanted to vomit in the bushes before I knocked on most of these doors, but that being jazzed about what I was learning about business was bigger than the fear. So you stick with it. And that's become a life lesson for me, no matter what I'm looking to tackle. It's like, what is the bigger than emotion? Like what's bigger than what's wanting to hold me back? And that will keep you mm. going forward. But the big, the big business lesson I learned uh, was when I used to fill up these cartons of eggs on Thursdays, I used to meticulously clean off all the chicken poop. And there was a lot of chicken poop on these eggs, but people wanted clean eggs and, you know, farm fresh eggs are a multitude of colors. They're, they're not bleached white, right? So they're all different sorts of colors, but they had a fair amount of chicken poop on them. So I'd clean them off. And then one Thursday I had this idea, just thinking about how much I was loving business thinking, well, what if I left a little bit of the chicken poop on the eggs? Like, would I be able to send a message to my customers that these eggs really were farm fresh? I wondered if I was over sanitizing them and making them look store-bought. Mm -hmm. So I started leaving a little chicken poop on the eggs. And sure enough, people, my customers opened the eggs. They winced a little bit. They were a little, just, just grossed out enough by the chicken poop. And then they, <laughs> every one of them said the same thing. They all said, well, I guess they're farm fresh. And I realized that is such an important business lesson because one of the th one of the things that one of the tools we have in our arsenal in business is that we can evoke the emotion that we most want to get from people. And I wanted them to feel this is authentic. And that's what they wanted to feel, right? They wanted to feel that these eggs were authentic. It kind of justified the purchasing decision. It made them feel better. And by the way, I was charging almost double the grocery store price for a dozen eggs. Um, but it wasn't about the home delivery that had the value. The value is that they were farm fresh. So getting that across, that's when I realized how much power we actually have in business in a, not in a manipulative way, but the power to actually make people feel the way they want to feel, right? Mm -hmm. They wanted, she, the, my customer wanted to feel that these eggs were authentic. And I figured out how to give them the feeling they wanted to feel, which justified their buying decision, paying twice as much money to me than they would have to in the grocery store. And whether it's eggs or it is, you know, the finest of things in life, that principle holds true that people want to feel what they want to feel to feel good about what they've purchased. So many different ways I want to take that because again, <laughs> as, as a business owner, my intent and maybe for my business, grossing out the client is not necessarily what I'm going to lead with, but certainly the uncomfortable truths 
around the impact to individual leader reputation or team or business performance if things don't shift is certainly an emotional reaction that then follows through with the logical, what, what's the financial opportunity cost if you choose not to do differently? And so you, you've sparked my thoughts. Yeah, it's, it's predetermining Even. what, again, everything, everything I do, all my work is, whether it's you know, my books, my coaching work, my business institute, everything I do is really focused on deeply knowing the people you serve. I think that's way overlooked. With the work I do goes way beyond avatars, demographics. Like I'm more into psychographics and, and behavior patterns. Like I, that's how I became successful as a photographer. I grew up lower middle class and ended up becoming the most sought after portrait photographer amongst the wealthiest families. How did I accomplish that? I took the time to understand what the world looks like from their perspective. I went to the stores and the restaurants where the people I wanted to serve went to. And I just, I witnessed it. I went and, and just imagined if I were them, what would I need to see here and feel? So then I, then I recreated that in the photography business that felt incredibly familiar to them. I created exactly what they needed to see here and feel in my brand messaging, brand image, marketing, everything I did. So everything, all my work is focused on deeply, deeply understanding what makes your customers tick and then giving them what they need to see here and feel. So for example, when I work with my clients on uh, brand messaging for their websites, which is something I do often, that because that's what I'm good at. I'm good at helping people figure out what do your customers need to see here and feel in order to say yes to you, in order to choose you. But what we do is we, we follow what I call an emotional journey. That's the template I use and I've designed. And what we do is we predetermine what we want people to say in their head and feel in their heart at every step of the website. So we predetermine, we predecide what we want our ideal customer to say in their head when they land on the website. We want them to say, oh, wow, this looks like me. This mm -hmm. looks like where I belong. Okay, because then they'll stay. If they feel like that's where they belong, they'll stay. They'll stay long enough just to scroll a little bit. And then we immediately want them to feel like, oh, wow, it's like this person's in my head. They really understand me. Right, So we're going to make sure we ask the right questions, make the right points, say the right things that are so intimate to what we know about our ideal customer. They can't help but say, oh my gosh, it's like this person's in my head, which I always say to my clients, that's the goal in marketing. The goal in marketing is to get one of your clients to say, wow, it's like you were in my head because then you've got really gotten in there. Then, you know, as they scroll on, we want them to see how you work, how you operate. And so that their response is, okay, obviously this is not your first rodeo. You know what you're doing, right? So we, and this, this is true of all of marketing, whether it's website, brand messaging, all of marketing, I've always taken the time to predetermine what the people I serve want to feel and what they want to say to themselves and then give them what they need or do what needs to be done to give them that, including leaving poop on a chicken egg. Right. If that's what it takes to give them the feeling that they want to feel, I'll do it. Yeah. You know, now that you've shared that, I can see I was going to ask you about your new book, um, The Self-Employed Life, and you've broken it into three sections. And counter to many start your own business books that I may have read through the last 17 years and beyond, you don't actually start with the business perspective. No. You're starting with the human and the individual business leader perspective. So tell, oh, look at that. I get an automatic thumbs up. Um, tell me a little bit about the rationale. Why did you choose to start there? Same with my, my first book, Lingo, actually. It's, it's definitely, it's that, so it's actually represented my two books. Um, Lingo starts with more of the business strategy and ends with the personal development. I just won't, I won't give people action steps in business development without also supporting who they are as a person. I just won't do it. And I hope that I will never do it um, because I think that's why people feel like they get stuck on a hamster wheel. The reason mm -hmm. why people are overwhelmed is like, yeah, you can't just keep loading up the sack until you have figured out what you're doing with it. Uh, I, look at, I look at personal development as a ceiling, like a, like a dome. The only way you, be, you can become more successful is that you have to raise the ceiling within yourself. So for example, you have to believe that you deserve everything. You deserve more than you currently have. 
before you apply action to get more. Otherwise, you're literally trying to, to stuff too much in a sack. So I always lead with personal development. With my first book, Probably Out of Insecurity, we started with the business strategies first. I give them what they came for and then back it up with the personal development. When I wrote my second book, The Self-Employed Life, I just felt so strongly that I wanted to focus on the personal development first. I had to make a really strong case to my publisher to do that because that, like you're saying, that's just not normally done. I'm like, well, I won't do it otherwise. I will self-publish it if I have to, but this book, it's going to focus on personal development first. And then there will be no shortage of business strategies, but I'm not going to be another, uh, another piece in the world that is causing people greater anxiety, more overwhelm and less focus by continually giving people ideas on things they can act without developing the person first. So it's incredibly important to me that we develop the, ourselves first. I know from my own experience as a journey as being a small business owner is it can be very lonely. It is very easy to look across and compare what I see others doing, you know, the director's cut of their successful business and then immediately start laying on myself that I'm not doing enough. I should be doing more. I'm failing and getting into this downward spiral. And your initial chapter, even in the, at the beginning of the book, is about getting out of your own way. Mm -hmm. So what are the, some of the common ways that we as business owners get in our own way and prevent the very success we're trying to achieve? So as I said a moment, I look at personal development as capacity. That's just the word I try to get people to use. Um, so one of the ways that people get in their own way is that they don't increase the capacity of what they deserve, what they're capable of, what they believe. So you really have to work on that first, right? You really have to. So one of the ways that people get in their own way is not taking the time to kind of increase the capacity. So they literally feel like they deserve more. They want more. They can handle more. I mean, one of the great ironies of, of being a business coach is the number of people that reach out to you for business growth, for which I am more than capable of helping them figure out ways to grow their business. Um, again, but also very practical. Like one of my one of the fastest ways to grow your business is only work with your, your ideal clients. Like kill the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule. Like that doesn't work for small business owners. We don't have time to waste that 80% of our income comes from 20% of our people. Like we need everybody to pay off. Mm -hmm. When you work so hard to get your ideal clients and keep them, we need them all to pay off. So Step number one, really get clear on who your ideal clients are and how are you going to speak to them, what you need to do to get and attract your ideal clients, because that's step number one, that's the way to exponential growth. So, um, you know, I can give more than enough business strategies, but we first have to get clear on, you know, who you want to work with. Um, one of the other ways, and I'm, I'm definitely spending a fair amount of studying this these days, because it's, if it, if it's not completely my next book, it's going to be a big part of a future book, which is about self-doubt. Fascinated by mm. self-doubt and the influence it has on um, particularly high achievers. Like this will be a book about, or at least content about the magnitude of self-doubt with high achievers, which I think oddly enough, and ironically, paradoxically, self-doubt often increases with achievement. We somehow think it's one of those things we're going to leave behind, but the more of a trail of success that you build behind you, the more weight of pressure there is to sustain it and the more self-doubt mm -hmm. come in. Um, <laughs> I have a really good self-doubt survey, which any of your listeners can take at selfdoubtsurvey.com. Um, it's very cathartic, is what people have told me. <laughs> They've gotten a okay. lot out of it. But one of the, the key questions that I love is asking people, like, in your moments of most significant self-doubt, is are you doing something for the first time or is it something you've done before? And overwhelmingly, the result has been, I feel more self-doubt when I'm doing something I've done before. Oh, that sounds counterintuitive. So why do you think that is, Jim? Because you've set a bar. Like once you set the bar of expectation, like once you've done something, and regardless of how you accomplished it, probably, again, for high achievers, probably somewhat successfully which is why you're willing to do it again or something similar. But now you set a standard for yourself and we collapse, particularly high achievers, we collapse under the pressure of, of expectation. Like we think, we, we think it drives us, but at the same time, it's expectation. It's always setting us up for you know, potential imposter syndrome or fear. It's holding us back. 
So overwhelmingly, people tend to feel more self-doubt when they're going into something similar or the same thing again. Like I've accomplished this, but now it's, it's sort of, um, if you think about the, what do they call it? The sophomore experience. Like if you mm -hmm. are, right, if you're a singer, I mean, by and large, the greatest number of albums that have flopped have been the second album. Like, you know, I mean, think about how one hit wonders, right? But think about how many times people come up with it. Can you imagine following a highly successful first album? That's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of pressure, which is why so many people like this, the sophomore album is almost always never as good as the first one or movies. Look how many that's true of movies too. How many sequels just don't measure up to the second one because you've, you've ra raised a bar of expectation amongst people who are going to watch or listen. I don't know about you, but my inbox is full of um, messages from people who are offering to close me 10 more clients a month, yeah. book this, that, and the other, the silver bullet that's going to transform my life. Mm -hmm. They all go straight to spam at the current, current point. But the reality is there are some common sense steps that we can all take, whether the business that we're growing is a startup that we're doing ourselves or whether it's our own career is the business that we're marketing. So what's the one piece of advice that if you could go back to the younger you and say, do this sooner, believe this sooner, what would that one piece mm. of advice be? Love that question. And by the way, I also just want to address your silver bullet in emails. Um, I'm the complete antithesis of silver bullet. I'm actually the other way around. I usually point out this is going to take longer than you think, but it will be worth it, right? So mm -hmm. my, like my self-employed business institute is a five-month curriculum. And we actually, we have built in a six month check-in after the five months. We do so it. So month 11. Uh, month 11, we do a check-in. Yeah. yeah. Um, because we're, I'm a realist. When they come into the program, I was like, hey, you know, in the five months, man, you're going to get so much information. You're not going to be able to apply all this, but you're going to apply it for the six months after you finish. So, hey, let's check in with you 11 mm -hmm. months, you know, six months after completion, because that's when I know you're going to need the support. And that's when you've had time to enact it. So I'm the other way around. I'm like, yeah, I'm the, I'm the antithesis of silver bullet. It, they never work. They're just a sales technique. I sell myself by being honest and truthful and say, I want you in the long run to be highly successful. But and here's what's realistic, <laughs> right? So I take a different approach. But that one bit of advice, oh my gosh, I, I love this question because it's, I, it's the hardest thing. I always say it's the hardest thing to sell as a coach. It's the hardest message to sell and it's clarity. If I have to give anybody mm -hmm. the number one advice, the sooner you can get absolute clear clarity is an iterative process, undoubtedly. But this, if there's ever a reason to hire a coach, if there's ever a reason to join a curriculum like my business institute, it's because of how much it will speed you getting to the points of clarity that you need clear clarity about who your ideal customer is and what you need to say to them clarity about your brand messaging that's that's saying the right things to the right people clarity about the direction you're going in because then you march forward with confidence if there's anything the magic wand or silver bullet if there ever was one is to to get to the point of clarity it, it's life-changing when I'm working with my clients and students and able to see, and one thing I'm really good at is helping them get their brand messaging clear. Like it's hard to do that ourselves. That's one of the, one of the nuances mm -hmm. of being employed is that you can't read the label from inside the jar. And we are so in the jar when it's our own business. Oh yes. Right. That's why you need outside consultants, coaches, et cetera. One of the things I happen to be particularly good at, which I think is my photographer's brain, is I can see the brand messaging that other people can't see in themselves. I can see the combination of elements and be like, boom, that's interesting. It's different. It's compelling. It will attract your right clients. Let's, let's build on that. So I don't necessarily expect the people I work with, my clients and students, to even do all the work. I use my own strengths to help them get to that clarity. But when, when I see somebody get the brand messaging that feels like they just grabbed the brass ring. When I see them get clear on who their ideal client is, that they can, they can see with clarity where they're going to make their money in the future, their whole body changes, their shoulders go back, their head. The, the energetic difference is so massive that I feel like you've just, you've just let them soar. And everybody after the point of, of really getting clarity about who they serve, how, 
and what they need to say to them, the direction they're going in, what's marketable. When they get that clarity, they just march forward with such strength that the success that they're looking for just comes that much quicker. Without a doubt, Morg, that the number one thing I'd want people to get quicker is clarity. And I don't know that you can do it on your own. I really don't. I don't know that we can get the clarity we need on our own. It's very hard to do. If there's ever a reason to hire someone or to, to join a program, it is for that benefit alone. And I, I say that sincerely as someone who yes, sells services and it's not a sales pitch. It's genuinely advice from somebody who's been in business for 40 years. <laughs> like, and I think I would concur because as I flash back to 17 years ago, and I think with anybody who's starting their own business, whatever the circumstances, invariably, it's not that we aren't smart enough to run our own business. And I know when I started Sky Team, I would do anything. I created an employee handbook for a local business. That wasn't what lit me up. Yeah. That wasn't what I wanted to do, but it brought a few pennies in for that month. And therefore, I made that trade off with hindsight. And hindsight is always 2020 and a bit cruel and mean. It wasn't a good use of my time because in that same time that I invested in creating that rat run of a, a product line, I could have been invested in doing something else. And so having an accountability partner, somebody to your point, looking at the label or looking from the outside of the jar, you can say, at uh -uh, Morag, just because you can, you should not be yeah. printing all of the program materials at Staples and putting them into the white ring binder. It's time for you to hire a graphic designer or outsource that to a local publishing house, which is what we do now with our materials. Yeah. But for a long time, I resisted because I looked at the false economy of, well, I'm going to save a few dollars if I just do it myself, as opposed to, no, no, I'm going to gain hours if I delegate if this and I can years. reinvest those yeah. hours. You, 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 in yeah. something else you get you gain years in the mm -hmm. iterative process clarity is, is on its own clarity is a very slow iterative process it's like you're ticking all the boxes very clear you have to speed that up i mean in in my business institute our marketing of the self-employed business institute is specifically um we're looking for people in business for two to five years and we we're not even looking for people Brand, you know, right. Except the exception to that is we do work with a lot of corporate students. A lot of people, former corporate folks have joined the Business Institute, uh, but they have decades of experience behind them in an area of expertise. So they're not green. They're not new, but they might be new to starting a business. And to your point earlier, many, many of our students have PhDs, master's degrees. We had a NASA scientist, like really smart people. It's not a measure of intelligence. Clarity has nothing to do with intelligence. Clarity is a combination of what you have to offer and what the world wants, right? It's the clarity of this is what you're good because you can you can have a great widget, but if it's not what the world wants, it's not going to go anywhere. Yeah. It's a combination of really getting clear on what you bring to the table and, and what's important. Again, another another argument for clarity is that hardly any of us are in a field by ourselves anymore. There's a million leadership coaches. So how mm -hmm. do you single yourself out? It's what, what we work for is what I refer to as everybody's unique perspective. And no p two people can have perspective. In fact, unique perspective is, is more unique than DNA, right? Your unique, it's why that in a, in a single family, you can have very similar DNA among siblings. And yet, those same siblings can, can see their family experience entirely different from one another, <laughs> even specific circumstances, because we all lay on experiences, our, our own perspective. So the work to be done to get clear about what you bring to the table that's different is a process of what do you bring to the table that's different? What's your unique perspective? What are your experiences? How do you see the world differently? How, what are your similar, what are your overriding philosophies? It's a combination of elements that makes that, will make you different from anybody else in your field. Then you highlight that, you message that in your brand messaging, you figure out how to highlight that. How does that speak to the people you wanna to speak to? So as a clarity is an iterative process that on its own will take years. If you get help and support from somebody who understands the benefits of clarity, you can speed up that process. And that's why we, we focus on businesses two to five years because it's such a tender time. I find that by five years, and you might recall this, 12 years ago for you, at about the fifth year, if it's not starting to pay off, you're starting to, to give up. You're running mm -hmm. out of steam, you're running out of financial resources. 
I mean, you can you can only give so much of yourself and of your finances for so long before you're running out. And it's usually about five years. So I want to intervene and speed up the clarity process so people can get where they get a really good head start before their fifth and fifth, fourth and fifth year. What role have relationships played in your success? Oh, it's everything, honestly. And, and um, you know, as I'm as I'm out there more recently, certainly you know, post pandemic, uh, kind of relaunching my speaking career, which was on hiatus, and I took a couple of extra years uh, to take care of my my ailing mom. Um, that now that I'm putting myself back out there as a speaker, what I one of the things that I say in my my pitch to organizations about speaking is I give a little context to my background being a photographer for affluent families. And uh, the line I use is, I don't just know this market, I was in their closets. Okay. I mean, as their family photographer, I was literally in their closets, you know, and that's, it's a metaphor, but it's literal and that's intimate. Not everybody mm-hmm. gets invited to people into people's closets. Like I was invited into their massive walk-in closets to figure out what clothes are going to look big, best on them, to help them uh, deal with the insecurities of their own body, what they wanted to show, what they didn't want to show, what what's what's going to work together and harmonize as a family. Like it's all relationships. I mean, for me, like I said earlier, that everything I do is about deeply understanding the customers you serve. It is a a level of intimacy and dare we use the word in business love that I just don't think we get enough of, you know, I mean, I genuinely love my coaching clients, my students, I love my photography clients to the degree that I wanted intimate relationships with them. I wanted to deliver to them, not just a quality product, but I wanted to deliver to them a feeling that someone had their back. You know, and as a photographer for affluent people, one of the things I was very responsible for was how they presented themselves to other people, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, my portraits are often used on their holiday cards that they're sending out to a thousand people. Um, I had to really understand how they wanted to be perceived. I held their image, their public image in my hands. And to get there, to get to another, and more than anything, I not only wanted to accomplish the goal, I wanted them to know that I was their ally. I was their ally in achieving that. So to me, relationships, um, there's just no too far you can go. I mean, I've, I'm like, I'm willing to get into the closets <laughs> with <laughs> photography clients, and I get into the closets with my coaching clients all the yeah. time. Get into the closets to really have the conversations that are meaningful and build relationships that, that probably last a lifetime. I, I love everything. You've used words there that speak to my heart around the relationships, being an ally, having people's back. That is the essence for us in You, Me, We, why we all need a friend at work, whether we're a solopreneur, whether we're running a small team, or whether we're part of a giant multi-industrial organization. It's the relationships that come to the heart of it and will cause our clients to come back to us again and again and to refer us to others again and again. Yeah. Well, I appreciate so much so that, that the phrase I like to use when I when I teach loyalty and retention, uh, which is something I, fair, I speak on a fair amount, but I reframe it. It's like, yeah, I, we could call this loyalty and retention, but there's one goal here. The goal is how can we keep people in our world as long as possible? Like that's the goal. It has a lot more heart and meaning to it than it does. Like what's our retention rate? How, what are our customer loyalty programs? Can we just punch a card after they've bought mm-hmm. 10 ice cream cones? Like, you know, that's lame. <laughs> when it's you, transactional. It's transactional. Right. What I want, what I want the people I work with and I coach, what I want them to really embody is, is their creativity think around what do I need to do to keep people in my world as long as possible? Like I said, like we developed in our business institute to check in six months later. Uh, we have many, many things in the business institute that are really built around, for one, our alumni benefits. Like once somebody completes the five-month program, you can actually do everything in the program all over again for as long as you'd like. Like it's a one-time investment. And we do that because we have a great community. We have open coaching calls. We have guest speakers and workshops. Um, our students come back. They sit in on training sessions they've already sat in on when they were in the cohort, but they mm-hmm. want to hear it again because they, they're at a different stage in their business. So again, but what that does for me, and there's nothing more satisfying for me when I see a student from three years ago pop into a training session 
I'm like, I've kept them in my world. Like that's what's important to me. So that brings us almost full circle because we started by talking about your book opening with personal development. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious for you, Jeffrey, what is, what is your personal development? What's caught catching your attention right now? Hmm. Right now, I'm, I'm a huge reader. That's always a big, been a big part of my, um, a friend of mine is writing a novel and I, I said to her, she asked if I'd be an early reader. And I said, sure. And it will be the first novel I've read in 50 years. <laughs> like I, literally, I, I don't think I've, I read all nonfiction and I read about two books a week. Like I am, so that's a big part of my personal development is I just learn constantly. Um, I moved about a year, a little more than a year ago from Miami to North Florida and loved Miami, but it is a city that once you leave it, you realize it's an assault on your senses. Like it, everything about it's wonderful, but it's loud, it's noisy, it's bright and everything's big. And, and I'm from New York city. So but mm -hmm. New York city didn't feel like an assault on the senses to me because it was just, it was the environment which I grew up in, but Miami, as much as I loved it and I really did, um, when I left it and moved to North Florida. So a big part of my personal development now is I'm living in a, instead of a high rise condo, I'm living in a hundred year old home, antique home, um, with a, with, I've installed a bunch of gardens. My house is on the town garden tour in, in May. Um, so that's a big part of my, my own personal development now is the environment that I'm creating. I'm living in a super, the town I live in looks like a Hallmark movie. Like it just, it's ridiculously quaint. <laughs> Are you um, forever um, baking cookies as well? I, I, I bake a lot of cookies. I make waffles. <laughs> um, literally, like I got back into baking, which has always been a love of mine. But, you know, like I always said, you don't use your oven in Miami. It's too hot. So mm -hmm. baking wasn't something I kind of something I gave up for years. So a big part of my personal development now is my environment, which is honestly always has been. It's also why I've always lived near the ocean. Like I mm -hmm. am a big proponent of taking great care of your environment. One of the things I talk about in the self-employed life, which has gotten a lot more attention than I expected in the book, it's called Switching Spaces. And it's a strategy by which I have different workstations set up in my house. Like I do, I do different things in different areas of my home. Um, areas that foster creativity, areas where I pay bills. But what I do, and it's also a strategy to be more efficient because it, task switching wastes a lot of time. So instead of task switching, environment switch. So what I do is like, oh, okay, this is my task. This is the area I do this task to. So I move into that area and my brain naturally gets in gear for the task that is accustomed to that area. And that's, a, that's always been important to me because I'm always writing a lot of content, whether I'm writing my next book or writing speeches, or what have you. So I have a creative spot that at you know, a certain hour of the day, it's like, boom, done with calls and tasks. I move into my creative spot and I'm immediately engaged. So I don't have this long unwinding process that I have to go through. So I find switching spaces is one of my, my life hacks <laughs> to actually have different spaces for different tasks so that when you move into the space, your energy and your body slips almost immediately into here for the task of that area. It seems so obvious and it's something that I think and I intend when I get back from vacation to integrate that as a habit for me because the risk is in this modern day world, my commute is bed desk. Yeah. And this is where I'll sit for eight yeah. hours as opposed to if I've got these deliberate trigger points where I am getting up and moving, however short that might be, but it does change your perspective on the work that you're doing and remove you from the distractions, maybe of the laptop, yep. the phone and everything it, else. It really does. Up. And it's, and like I said, it's a part of the, it's a chapter of the book that got a lot more attention than I, I thought it would. Um, but people have really, like you said, it's so obvious, but people don't think to do it, you know, and mm -hmm. have an area set up. Like I have one desk in my home that half of the desk is where I do my podcasting and the other half of my desk, I pay bills, right? But when it's time to pay bills, I just, or, you know, any kind of bookkeeping or anything logical, I just shift to that side and I light a candle I, and there's a little, <laughs> there's a Buddha there and some hands, like I have more spiritual stuff on that side of the desk because I want to feel good, as good as one can feel paying taxes and bills and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, but it's just a shift, but it's a, you know, it's a physical shift, but then a, an energetic shift. So I can get immediately into the task at hand. Well, you've energized me in our conversation today, Jeffrey. For those who we've piqued the curiosity, 
tell them a little bit about some of the goodies and resources that they can find if they choose to hunt you down. Yeah. <laughs> so exactly. Um, you know, what, what might be, since we, we spoke a fair amount about uh, brand messaging and the importance of saying the right things to your ideal clients. So with that in mind, if anybody has a website they'd like me to review, that is something I offer. Complimentary. Uh, you can go to brandmessagereview.com, fill out an application. The application is very intentionally designed in that it asks you some probing questions um, that are um, might not be as obvious to you as you might think. <laughs> um, but what I find is that I get very honest answers in the application. I get a very I get a very strong sense of what people are about, and then I go to their website. And that's where I, 98, I can tell you statistically 98% of the time, the heart and character I felt in the application is not coming through on the website. And then I'll write back and give you three tips on how you can improve the messaging on your website. Hmm. So brandmessagereview.com. It's a very specific process for me because I said I find I get, I get a sense of people's real essence in the application. And 98% of the time I go to the website, I'm like, wow, this doesn't even feel like the right per the same person, either because it was designed by someone who didn't take the time to really understand their client, or it's this professional facade we put on when we're marketing ourselves that creates a veneer that you actually want to break down so that your ideal clients can really see you for who you are. All right. Well, Jeffrey, thank you again for your time and insights today. I'll make sure that those links are in the show notes below. And I appreciate your time. Wishing you ongoing success and a whole ton of fun. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you so much for joining Morag today. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe so you don't miss a thing. If you learned something worth sharing, share it. Cultivate your relationships today when you don't need anything before you need something. Be sure to follow Sky Team and Morag on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you have any ideas about topics we should tackle, interviews we should do, or if you yourself would like to be on the show, drop us a line at info at skyteam.com. That's S-K-Y-E team.com. Thanks again for joining us today. And remember, business is personal and relationships matter. We are your allies.